Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and Watchmen is the new series on HBO, a continuation of Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons' groundbreaking 1986 graphic novel, not a sequel to Zack Snyder's 2009 film adaptation, though this is HBO. Dr. Manhattan can totally expose himself again and again if he wants to. Let us break down and analyze this Watchmen pilot episode to explain what this series is, how it connects to the timeline, both fictional history and shockingly real history, the deeper themes and symbols, and yes, hidden Easter eggs, because this is a Damon Lindelof off joint they're all over the place after this you're gonna be the most informed nerd in your watchmen watch party even if you like me watch the watchmen alone let us get started the pilot opens on a silent film featuring bass reeves the black marshal of oklahoma bass reeves was a real guy first black deputy u.s marshal west of the mississippi born into slavery emancipated into a free man a farmer and then chosen to be a marshal he served from 1875 to 1907 major badass arrested like 3,000 people, including his own son at one point. This silent film immortalizes him in a way most silent films would never do from that era. In fact, they were more famous for demonizing black people, as we saw in W.D. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. Super racist film. The imagery here is a reversal of the black hat, white hat trope in westerns. The good guy here isn't black. The sheriff wears the white hat, but he's a corrupt lawman who steals cattle. It actually foreshadows the mystery at the end of the episode about Judd Crawford, the white hat sheriff, who's probably not what he seems. His apparent murderer is the boy watching here, Will Reeves, maybe even related to Bass Reeves, like his grandson. His father's name is O.B., maybe B, his middle name Bass, after his father. This is set in Tulsa in 1921, the day of the infamous firebombing of Black Wall Street, a prosperous black community that was destroyed by a white mob that suspected a black shoe shiner for raping a white woman. This is true history, folks. It was the single worst incident of racial violence in American history. Not enough people know about it, and not enough people were told about it in their A-push classes in high school. So the silent film that he was watching is called Trust in the Law, and its propaganda supported by the then reality in Tulsa. It was a city run by black cops, black firefighters, black business owners, but during the massacre, residents are being attacked by white Klansmen and white looters. And again, not revisionist history. Black Wall Street was run by black people, as were many Southern communities in the Reconstruction era, until the Union abandoned Southern blacks and deal to win the White House in 1876, allowing Jim Crow laws to take effect and the Klan to wipe out blacks from any political influence, often via murder. Will's parents send him away with friends in a truck, but firebombs cause it to crash, leaving only Will and the driver's orphan baby. And this note from Will's father, watch over this boy, or watch over this boy. It's on the back of this colored soldier of the state paperwork, with Will's father probably hoping it will bear some significance to whomever Will ends up with. And Will, after seeing that boy earlier holding the dead baby in the city street, he lifts this baby and wraps it in an American flag blanket. Could this be an origin story of some kind? Probably. I'll explain what my theory is later. But let's move on to the modern era, the year 2019, the fictional universe after the events of Watchmen in 1986. So let's explain this alternate history so we're all on the same page. In the Watchmen graphic novel, Richard Nixon stayed president through 1986. There was no Watergate. He had used the early era Watchmen, who were then called the Minutemen, to win the Vietnam War and annex Vietnam as the 51st state. That's why the flags of this universe have that new circular design of those Minutemen. The most powerful and only true superhuman of them was Dr. Manhattan, who was a godlike Superman figure who became the ultimate nuclear deterrent. But then, later on in 1986, a former Minuteman, the comedian, got murdered. It was part of a broader conspiracy by Adrian Vate, Ozymandias, to stage an attack by what people thought was a trans-dimensional squid monster on New York. It killed a million people. Really, it was a giant artificial thing created by a team controlled by Vate who were all killed off as part of a conspiracy. It was all about tricking the US and the Soviet Union to end the Cold War and join forces against an external threat. And it worked! He won! During this plot, the 80s Watchmen were the Gen 2 vigilante team headed up by Night Owl Daniel Dryberg, carrying the mantle from the original Night Owl Hollis Mason. They're nerdy engineers all about tech. Dryberg piloted a Batwing style owl ship that we see in this episode. Also part of that team was Silk Spectre, Lori carrying on the mantle from her mother, the original Silk Spectre, Sally Jupiter. In this show, an older Lori is played by Jean Smart. She changed her last name to Blake after her father, Edward Blake, the comedian, who actually tried to rape her mother, Sally. So obviously there's some weird dark story going on here. Stopping that attack at the time was another Minuteman, Hooded Justice, who is now the subject of a Ryan Murphy style series, American Hero Story. So Ozymandias' squid false flag attack was kept a secret for the greater good. But the vigilante Rorschach 
Black uncovered the conspiracy and before his death, mailed his journals to a newspaper, which is how the Watchmen graphic novel ends. So now in the show, 33 years later, Rorschach's anarchist legacy has inspired a white supremacist cult called the Seventh Cavalry, spelled with a K, the racist letter. The Seventh Cavalry with a C from our history dates back to the army unit of General Custer in the Battle of Little Bighorn, which is now a code word. Perhaps the Seventh Cavalry sees Rorschach as their Custer-esque martyred hero. This terrorist group hates President Robert Redford, huh? Actually, in the final page of the Watchmen comic, it hinted that he would be running in 88 to replace Nixon. Now, Robert Redford has issued reparations to revitalize black communities like Tulsa, and these reparations are nicknamed by racists as Redfordations. The goal of these reparations is to restore Black Wall Street to what it was, and it appears like they're doing that. Years earlier, the 7th Cavalry staged an attack called the White Knight, targeted a bunch of known police officers in their home, so now cops conceal their identity under masks. So everyone, cops, terrorists, superheroes, everyone is now anonymous. I'll explain later how those blurring of lines may have led to something very dark to happen. So there's this police officer, Sutton, who pulls over someone who he suspects is part of the 7th Cavalry. He has to get approval for remote release of his firearm by Panda, the Tulsa PD rule meister, it looks like, but it's too late. Notice that right after he gets shot, the lights flash to create this rhythmic ticking. Just like in the graphic novel, the motif of ticking clocks is all over this series. It sounds like that ticking sound effect is meant to signal a character in mortal danger, just as it does for Judd later. Now, moving on to the all-black production of Oklahoma. How charming. So just like Tulsa is now back to its Black Wall Street days, notice how the church in the Oklahoma production set matches the one in the silent film. Also, later we'll see on the marquee that this is directed by Tessa Hurston, perhaps a descendant of known black author Zora Neale Hurston. So the title of this episode is It's summer and we're running out of ice. It's a lyric from this musical, the song, Oh, Judd is dead. Judd was the villain of Oklahoma. He dies. He gets a ballad earlier in the play where he bemoans how everyone hates him so much that if he killed himself, they wouldn't bother keeping his body on ice for a funeral. They would bury him immediately to keep him from rotting in the summer heat. This Judd later explains how he once played the hero Curly in Oklahoma. The fact that his name is Judd, plus the title of the episode, should signal to all the musical theater geeks watching this that his death is imminent and that he might not be the good guy of this story. So Judd checks on Sutton and he meets with the detective Wade, AKA Looking Glass. He explains that the shooting was over lettuce. Judd jokes, were there any croutons? And then he says, Don't start a war over goddamn lettuce, Wade. So this attitude, plus the fact that Judd refused to call in Angela or Red are definitely clues pointing to Judd not taking this that seriously, or at least wanting this investigation to be a bit off the books. So as Judd meets with Sutton's wife, the TV shows Dr. Manhattan on Mars. He's demolishing the structure. Now in the graphic novel, Manhattan left for Mars after the events, sequestering himself from the conflicts of man since his godlike powers have kind of left him apathetic. So then Angela, aka Sister Knight, teaches her recipes to her son's school class. Now the egg yolks form this smiley face, reflecting the smiley face imagery of Watchmen, but also the overhead shot of the red placemats kind of reflects the face and the cowl of Night Owl. There is some speculation that either Angela or Judd could be kind of carrying on the legacy of Night Owl, based on the owl imagery that surrounds them both, including Hollis Mason's biography under the hood on Judd's desk, and an owl mug, an owl that hoots in the final shot. Angela tells the kids about separating the yolks from the whites, perhaps reflecting her jaded perspective that the white supremacists will never get along with people of color. And she explains to the kids how she used to be a cop. She got shot on White Knight. But notice how her kids don't look at all like her or her husband, Cal. Maybe it's colorblind casting. Or maybe their kids were adopted from other dead detective friends of theirs who died during the White Knight. Like Topher gives her a knowing look when she discusses why she retired. Notice in the background of the classroom, there's a poster showing President Nixon and President Redford. There's also this world map. This looks different than the normal normal world map, it's because this map is called the Peter's Projection Map and more accurately reflects the proportions of the continents to correct the US and European biased maps of history. Another example of the social progressivism of the Redford administration. There's also a poster showing the anatomy of a squid. Now, why is this there? Well, apparently, as we see in the next scene, it rains tiny squids from time to time. They are preceded by an air raid horn, the same sound effect used for the Tulsa bombings in the opening scene. Now, these squids must be connected to Ozymandias' squid monster attack from 86. But remember, that was a hoax, of course, so someone must be continuing to make it rain squids in order to maintain that conspiracy so that it wouldn't have been an isolated event. This could be Ozymandias, it could be Dr. Manhattan, it could be the government. 
But notice that these squids dissolve almost immediately, a sign that they are probably made out of some artificial substance. Angela gets a message on her beeper. Everyone here uses old school technology because they associate digital communications with the squid attack in New York. As Angela heads to her bakery to gear up, there's a protester holding a sign with the phrase, the future is bright. There's an upside down Statue of Liberty. It's a callback to the Rorschach sign in the comics that said, the end is nigh. Also, the Tulsa Sun newspaper headline says, KKK vandalism forces the Statue of Liberty closure. And that's next to the top headline, Vate officially declared dead, suggesting that the Vate we see in the episode is living in secret. Why is he claiming this? The more on him in a second. But also there's a headline, Boise squid shower destroys homeless camp kills two. So either these rainy squid are deadly or those homeless people saw something they shouldn't. Angela also passes a mural for the restored Williams Dreamland, which we saw bombed in the opening sequence, another effect of Redford's reparations. Now reading that newspaper is an adult Will Reeves who asks, you think I can lift 200 pounds? He's foreshadowing his hanging of Judd at the end of this episode. Well, I kind of clocked Judd at 200 clocks. So Angela's alter ego is Sister Knight, which is inspired by Catholic nun iconography. She has crucifix dagger. She also carries this beaded weapon. Now this is a Vietnamese weapon called a mala. Combined with everything else she's got going on, it resembles a rosary bead. Her hood reflects a nun's habit. The white supremacists live in a trailer park called Nixonville. Angela drags out a culprit from there for interrogation without Judd knowing. The fact that she did that kind of pisses Judd off as if he didn't want her to take initiative. Judd shows the other police an anonymous style video by the 7th Cavalry in a proves the use of firearms, and he says, foreshadowingly, It's my funeral. Quis custodiat ipsos custodis? That is a Latin phrase from the original Watchmen, translating to who watches a Watchmen. Their response translates to we watch. Looking Glass interrogates the 7th Cavalry member that Sister Knight brought in. Now inside the pod, imagery flashes on the surfaces during this uh, lie detector test. Milk, the perfect family beverage, is a nod to milk kind of becoming the white nationalist dog whistle. There's also an image of Mount Rushmore with Nixon on it. There's images of Nathan Bedford Forrest, the founder of the KKK, Harriet Tubman, and various Rorschach ink blots. Notice that Looking Glass begins by wiping his mirror mask. He wants a suspect to be able to see the reflections of these images behind him as well. And notice that when they release the suspect from the pod, Judd looks lowers his hat over his face. Even though he's the only cop not to wear a mask, he covers his face here as if he doesn't want any look of familiarity between him and the 7th Cavalry member, maybe. Now, the info that Angela beats out of him leads to this cattle farm where the 7th Cavalry members are popping lithium batteries out of watches. They also distribute cyanide pills, similar to the pills that were swallowed by the assassins of Adrian Vait, though he was actually behind those assassins, suggesting that someone might actually behind these assassins as well. During the firefight, they try to escape in a plane, but Judd intentionally takes the owl ship too far to burn up the getaway plane before they can escape, almost as if he's trying to cover up something. Now his pilot is Pirate Jenny, inspired by the in-universe Black Freighter comics. Inside their trailer is an old bank poster featuring Dollar Bill, one of the original Minutemen, and a racist depiction throwing a black man out of a bank. Moving on to the estate of Adrian Vait, not dead as a newspaper reported, so why is he living in secret? Well, clearly Vait is up to something. His servants seem a bit off, they make a clearly inedible cake, and they think that a horseshoe is a knife, like Janet with her cacti. Perhaps they're androids that he built with anti-weapon protocols so they can't carry knives. They gift him with his pocket watch, and Vate tells him that he has written a play. It's a tragedy in five acts. The Watchmaker's Son. So, huh? Well, in the Watchmen comics, Dr. Manhattan, John Osterman's father, was a watchmaker. He is literally the watchmaker's son. So my theory is that Vate could be in a similar role as Ford from Westworld, an eccentric genius tinkering with AI to play God with a new narrative, a master clockmaker. And this watchmaker's son could be a new proto-Dr. Manhattan that he wants to generate as kind of a bizarro deterrent to Manhattan Superman, whom he wants to kill at the end of this five-act tragedy. Vate's mansion also looks pretty similar to the architecture of Manhattan's Mars structure that he demolished. So there may be a connection between these two. At dinner, Judd sings as Curly from Oklahoma, but as he does, the sound of a ticking clock comes in. From above. <laughs> it persists over an overhead shot of the table that looks like a clock and through Judd saying goodbye with the words. 
And then the opening credits of the American Hero Story program shows each of the Minutemen, and then Judd dresses up as if for his own funeral with a framed picture of him with presumably his father, uh, maybe a former sheriff, and they look kind of mean. I'm sure that will become significant. And on the ride to the hospital, the radio host talks about Senator Keen, the son of the original Senator Keen, the Watchmen comics who sponsored the Keen Act and made mass superheroes illegal. And now Keen seems to be running for president to replace Robert Redford, but Judd hits a spike strip, he gets hit by this flashing light, and then later Angela gets a call to come find him, strung up by a noose with elderly Will Reeves nearby. A drop of Judd's blood hits the badge, just like the drop of the comedian's blood on his smiley face pin in the opening of The Watchmen. And from the musical Oklahoma, Old Judd is Dead plays. Also, if you listen closely, you can hear the hooting of an owl. So what happened here? Well, obviously Judd is not the white hat good guy he seems to be. He appears to obstruct justice. He's got secrets. Will stringing him up mirrors the opening silent film of his maybe grandfather tying up a crooked sheriff, also involved in cattle conspiracies. I believe Judd could be connected to the 7th Cavalry. In fact, he might even be the masked leader in that video. Notice their eye color is similar and they both chant, tick tock, tick tock. Since both cops and terrorists are all masked, no one other than Judd would know anyone's faces. Maybe there's even more overlap among cops and members of the 7th Cavalry. Judd's death being so similar to the comedians might suggest his death was part of a similar cover-up, maybe connected to whatever Vate is planning, or the ongoing squid rain. Some have even suggested Will could be the original hooded justice, which would explain his superheroic strength and his experience with rope. Look folks, this is only the pilot. Many of these theories could just be bullshit. We'll see! I can't guarantee we will break down every Watchmen episode of this season, but one way that you can help us afford to spend more time on niche content like this is by becoming a patron of NRDS. Just check the link in the description for details. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at EAVoss. Thank you for joining me, and who watches The Watchmen? Seriously, uh, will someone watch it with me? I'm real lonely. <laughs>